Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Professor Hall and today we are talking about Flowers for Algernon by Daniel Keyes, published in 1959. If you have not already, make sure you go back and listen to the lecture that covers the summary of the novel because there are things I'm going to dive into in this lecture and in my following lecture that are going to be looking at the plot points a little bit more closely for our analysis. So let's get started. Um, <clears throat> today, in this lecture, I'm going to talk about the soft sciences, um, the narration of the book, and then I'll also be talking about religion in the book, which is a little bit of a minor theme, but something that I wanted to cover. In the next lecture, I'm going to get into a little bit more of the science of the book and the psychology, and um, and then we'll also talk about disability and the historical understanding of disability and how this book kind of reflects some of the thoughts and ideas in the culture at the time and also kind of um, <clears throat> looks at a future in which we have a different idea about disability or differing ability, what we would call it today. So um, the soft sciences, a lot of the books that we're reading this term and a lot of books that are covered in um, science fiction courses are based in hard science. They're hard science fiction. So they look at things like astronomy, chemistry, biology, anatomy. And um, you can think of some of the books that we've looked at so far. H.G. Wells, War of the Worlds hard science fiction book. It's looking at astronomy. It's looking at future technology, right, of um, things like lasers and gas canisters for, for warfare and robotics and all of those kind of things. Um, soft sciences are, are so-called soft because there's not precise testing for them. You can have a hypothesis, you can have a result, or sometimes you're looking at, you know, a person has a particular problem. How might that problem have come about by looking at the past of their life? Um, but it's not like something like chemistry where you can take this element and this element and combine them and get a very determined outcome each time. So when we talk about the soft sciences, what we're talking about are things like psychology, sociology, anthropology, all of those types of things. And certainly from, sorry if the dog is distracting, um, certainly from our, our reading before when we looked at Brave New World, dystopian literature a lot of times looks at both of these things, future advancements in, in realms of psychology and how people might um, develop culturally later on in the future, and then also technology and the hard sciences and how those might play a role in that development. But here we have a, a really, a book that's really steeped fully in psychology. And um, the biology that exists here is just this operation that we don't know the specifics of. Um, a little bit of science in terms of Algernon is the mouse. So the um, experiments that they're performing with Algernon. But the real concern for the author, I think, is kind of twofold to look at psychology, to look at advancements or possible future advancements in psychology. But and instead of this question that we've been kind of discussing all semester, we can versus we should, right? Um, or can we versus should we? The question here is, how can we treat all people with dignity? And how can we um, now and in the future look at people as human beings, even when they are different, even when they have a disability, um, the humanity of this character, Charlie, is really at the core of this novel. The fact that he is, particularly at the beginning of the book, um, being used for this experiment by people who almost do view him like Algernon, like a lab rat, um, that um, the ethics of that, <clears throat> the ethics of using a human being um, in an experiment of this type. So what I really want you to look for throughout the entire novel, we're going to get into the science and the psychology a little bit more next time of specific theories that are in this book. But what I want you to look for first and foremost is the idea that this is a human being 
and what does his humanity mean? Um, why does he need dignity? Why should he be treated with respect? I think this is a question that a lot of people are asking right now, particularly as internet trolls kind of abound <laughs> online that, um, a good example is some of the racist rhetoric, some of the sexist rhetoric, um, some of the fat shaming. This person is fat and therefore they're unhealthy. Therefore, they should not be treated with dignity. Um, this person is of a, a different um, gender than I am and therefore they should not be treated like a real person. That is underneath a lot of what is said and done to people online. And that is really core to this book. Kind of going along with that is this idea that Charlie himself is almost like Frankenstein's monster, although I hate to use that word monster even in relation to that book, as you guys know from hearing about Frankenstein from me before. But Frankenstein's creation is a man who is completely out of place and he does not um, belong with animals he doesn't really belong with men he feels like he doesn't understand his relationship to God and he doesn't know where he fits in this world that's incredibly isolating right if you think of a story like Pygmalion if you've ever read that play or if you've seen My Fair Lady the musical um, the same thing you have a person creating molding shaping someone and really not fully thinking hey this is a person that I'm playing with who's, whose life I'm messing with and I'm trying to improve their life but will it improve their life was charlie better on better off before all of this um experimentation began was his life better even though he has an intellectual disability um even though he's classified in this day and age as mentally retarded was his life of a better quality before he increased his intelligence um and again uh humanity and dignity so that's what i would like you to look at there um, point two, this kind of goes along with point two, the narration of the book. So I'm going to provide for you a video um, talking a little bit more about the science of language, linguistics, which is another soft science. And um, I don't want to get too much into the science of that here, but I would like you to know that I think that this book is um, concerned with linguistics similar to Frankenstein again, right? Um, the monster learned how to talk and read and write and, and how did that come about? Um, here, <clears throat> the sentence structures, the, um, the word choices, the spelling, I think is probably the most apparent um, for people who don't teach English <laughs> or who don't read tons and tons of books. Um, it's very consistent as Charlie gains intelligence and then loses that intelligence, kind of like the, a little bell curve there, um, that he begins in this very almost childlike way um, of describing his life and talking about things at, at various times. It's almost a cold description because he knows that he is writing these things for preservation. So one critic that I, I read said that it almost goes beyond first person because he knows he's not just writing it for himself to recall things, but he's writing this as a series of progress reports. And he's key, he's trying to make sure that they're kept for the sake of posterity, um, for other scientists to learn from. And so I'd like you to watch, I think this is something pretty easy to spot, um, watch for those changes. Another thing in terms of narration is reliability. Um, because Charlie has a dif dis a, um, an intellectual disability, at first, he's not possibly the most reliable narrator. Now, that's the way that some scholars would look at it, to say he's childlike, he has an intellectual disability, and therefore he's not reliable. I would say that he's quite reliable in describing his experience um, and his understanding of the world and, and describing that for a reader um, to understand what he's going through. But in another way, um, there are things, it, particularly in the way people treat him at work, 
um, in the way that he relates to his family that you have to read between the lines. So for example, he describes um, the guys at work getting him drunk and he doesn't kind of like that feeling, but it makes him feel funny and he falls down. But then everybody laughs and they say, oh, he pulled a Charlie or oh, that's so funny. And then he feels like he fits in. Um, again, the idea that later on he doesn't feel like he fits in anywhere. But this idea that his narration might not be reliable is really because he doesn't fully grasp um, everyone's motivations, right? Having said that, um, this is his story and his perspective. And we do definitely see... Um, in terms of his understanding of the world and other people, that grows as his intelligence grows. But there are still things there that he doesn't completely grasp, but that the author definitely does, and that we can as readers as well. And that has to do with some of his psychosexual development, some of his emotional development, some of these Freudian ideas that are at kind of the core of the book that we're going to talk about next time. So another thing that I'd like you to look at in terms of narration is irony. Now, a lot of times when people look for irony, they think of sarcasm, that's verbal irony, and that is not the kind of irony I'm talking about here. Um, what I'm talking about here is actually dramatic irony. Dramatic irony means that there's something that you as the reader knows that the character does not. And besides the fact that we kind of see Charlie moving towards this fate um, where um, we kind of can see what's coming, um, that idea that um, there are things in his life, particularly early on and then again later, that he does not understand that we do. Um, so later in the book, he encounters this um woman that he had been a possible romantic partner with or they were thinking about having a romance and he's back to his old self and she runs out crying and he says oh I must have done something wrong I don't know why she would cry like that and um <clears throat> doesn't fully understand as the reader, we do understand, right? Similarly with how different people are treating him at work and how they treat him differently. And as he, as his intelligence grows, um, they really do ostracize him the same, <laughs> they just like they did before. They ostracized him before, but now they're doing it in kind of a different way. And they're quite resentful of him. And so, um, again, that's connected to this idea of his humanity and, and, and having dignity and, and also um, struggling socially, just really struggling socially to, to fit in. So the fact that it's sometimes unreliable it's something we can debate. Um, the irony of uh, what we know that he doesn't as we read between the lines, but also the emotion. Um, I think out of all the books we're reading this term, this is probably the most emotional. It's quite a poignant, bittersweet book, particularly at the end. And um, <clears throat> I would like you to look for um, the emotional changes that Charlie goes through and the way that he's describing things. I would say that um, one of the ideas behind this book, and I, I don't have the quote exactly written here in my notes, but essentially what someone says is that nothing ever completely leaves your mind. It's always there. So um, we're going to, again, get into psychology more later. But the idea that if something happens to you, even if you repress a memory, it's still there in your mind. Um, his intelligence um, rises and then falls again. And can he remember all of the scientific, the mathematical things he learned? No. But I think that the emotional resonance of those events is still with him. And so... You have someone who goes on this roller coaster intellectually, but emotionally, I think still you can see quite a bit of growth from beginning to end. And certainly at the height of Charlie's intelligence, um, I think there's a real disconnect from his emotions and a real struggle. 
to emotionally cope with what he's going through. So that's something I would like you to kind of observe and, and discuss in our, in our discussion boards and in your assignments. The third thing that I wanted to talk about is religion. Religion is not the most prominent theme in this book, but it is there. Um, and um, interestingly enough, I know people who read this book in, in middle school or high school, and it was an expurgated or a, a censored version with things blacked out, or they were given the short story version of this to read. And, um, and, and the sex stuff was blacked out. And so was the religious stuff. Um, the version that I read when I was younger, I do not recall a lot of the sexual elements of the book. And my guess is that we either had a censored book that was like abridged, or that we read the short story, although I feel like it was longer. So it was probably an abridged version with the sex taken out, like for younger kids. Um, the religious elements at the beginning of the book, Charlie is, um, I think I would characterize him as a Christian. He has a very strong, but again, um, a lot of times he's characterized as childlike. And he has a very strong, but childlike faith. And fairly early on, <coughs> Sorry. Fairly early on in the book, after the operation, someone questions God. And he says, I really never thought about that before. I never thought that there wasn't a God or I never thought that there might be a different kind of God. And I want to say, too, just as a... Um, uh, uh, <laughs> As a caveat here, just to just to kind of let you know my take on it, I am a person of faith, so I read this kind of like, um, I don't want to say it's not exactly offensive, but it it really separates science and religion, and and the idea that the author puts forth is basically if you are intelligent, you would not believe in God, at least in a little bit of a way, <clears throat> at first through these discussions. So um, I can't wait until we talk about Madeline Engel's book, Wrinkle in Time, because she sees things on like a continuum where science is one way of looking and understanding the world and religion is another way of understanding the world and you need both. And there are kind of all these things in between. Um, but for Daniel Keyes, these are quite separate. Um, there are at various points, um, he kind of starts to question his religion. I think, again, as a person of faith, that it's important that you question your religion and your beliefs and find out if you really believe them and find out if you um, if you can investigate and, and see if they're true. Um, <clears throat> but certainly in 1959, that might not have been the most popular idea. And I think he probably did have a lot of people following their faith kind of blindly without question. So this is the, the religious and spiritual aspects are certainly part of Charlie's development. I think that spirituality, um, whether you're a person of faith or not, spirituality, the idea that you are um, growing closer either to God or to a better understanding of yourself or both. Um, <clears throat> having that type of growth, which does connect to some of the scientific Freudian principles we see here, um, that is quite important as we move from childhood to adulthood. Our place in the world, our place in the universe, all of those things. And so we have a tiny bit of that here as Charlie questions God, questions his faith. There are a few places where he's kind of at a, a heightened almost ecstasy. And it's kind of described almost like Nirvana, which would be, of course, of a, a different faith practice. Um, but <clears throat> in those sections, um, I'd like you to kind of look for that. The other thing I'd like you to look for is the end. Um, so after his intelligence decreases, what is his understanding of God at that point? Um, I think that when you look at the idea again, that once something is um, in your mind, it never fully leaves. The emotional and spiritual journey that he's been on, he talks about God, but he talks about God in kind of a different way. So it seems that he's kind of at one point 
throws God away out of his life almost. Um, and he becomes very interested in science alone. And then toward the end, he comes back to faith, but kind of of a different understanding of faith. So um, those are some things I'd like you to look at. Number one, the soft sciences, the psychology that we're going to dig more into next time. Uh, number two, the narration, the need for preservation of these events, the reliability, the irony, and then of course the emotion and connecting that to this idea that this is a human being who deserves dignity as all human beings do. And then lastly, the, the religious and spiritual aspects. How does he grow and change, not just intellectually, but spiritually, emotionally? Um, we're going to talk about his psychology and his sexuality later on uh, next time, but um, the emotional journey, the spiritual journey is just as important as the intellectual journey. And I think it's very fascinating in this book for the time period it was written in that the author is really taking a holistic approach to people as human beings and saying, Look, we're made up of all these different components. This guy's intelligence changes, but his personality for the most part, he is the same person. Um, he is kind of a jerk at one point where he's super smart, but it's also because he's emotionally coping with that and struggling with his place in the world. Um, so personality, spirituality, emotion, physicality, intelligence, all of these things are interconnected. And that is, I think, one of the beautiful things of this book that... Um, in terms of characterization, we we really get to know Charlie and and it's a, an intense look at um, his life and as is, is, is Charlie is a dynamic character who goes through these changes and and it's not I think you know even though it's science fiction in in those terms it's quite realistic. And we really get to know him and feel for him. So by the end, um, we really want him to to succeed or at least to be happy. So that's, that's where I'm going to leave off for right now. Uh, join me for my next lecture where I will talk about the science and the understanding of disability and uh, some of the historical context. Thanks, guys.